So, Jill and I uh, had an amazing trip uh, to Israel. Uh, it was awesome. And uh, before I went and after I came back, I've already had like several people say to me, if you go again, I want to go. Let's go. We, so, uh, like in 2020, uh, maybe we'll think about planning a trip. So start saving now. And, uh, you know, you only have to book it like about 11 months in advance. So start saving now. And I push something and it starts vibrating. It's a new clicker. So, um, But anyway, that'll be awesome if we get to go again. Uh, there's still a whole lot to see over there. And it was... It, it just is quite a blessing to be there. And I asked last week, how many of you have been to Israel? And like a third of the church <laughs> raised their hand. So that's, that's amazing, isn't it? That's just wonderful. So anyway, uh, in the next coming lessons, I want to share with you some of that journey we had. Uh, so I, I want to share with you some of the pictures and tell you a little bit about what, what we experienced. Uh, and then try to draw uh, a lesson from uh, those those places we stopped, we, in, we had seven full days of touring, and there were 40 sites that we visited. And I mean, it was just like, you know, and there's, there's like a, a, a lecture or a, a tour, you know, uh, a commentary at every site. And so it's like getting a, 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 a degree in, in Israel, you know. There's so much information. But, uh, but I just want to take some of the pictures and take some of the uh, experiences that we had and, and, then, uh, and then give just bring a lesson where they connect with scripture. Today I want to talk about Herod, Herod the Great. I didn't, I didn't really understand why he was considered Herod the Great. I mean, I knew a little bit about him, but, but in this trip I could see, wow, I learned a whole lot about Herod the Great and why he's considered so great. So I want to share that today and learn a lesson from Herod the Great. But in the, con in the meantime, <coughs> uh, this particular slide, and let me see if I'm... Tell me I'm in control, please. Well, that's not. Did you do that? So you're in control. I want this to work, though. Okay, that's backwards, and that's forward. Yay! Okay. <coughs> what I wanted to tell you first was uh, this picture. Can you see it okay? This picture is beautiful. Oh, my goodness. The scenery, if you could see it when we were there, the colors and everything, the light. This is the Dead Sea. And it was just amazing over the Dead Sea, uh, uh, the scene, the sky and everything. This area only gets six days of rain, and we got some of it. Uh, but it wasn't that bad. It was just in the morning and in the beginning and, and everything. But it was just beautiful, the scenery. Now, here's a, a 101 Christian quiz. Who knows what mountain range that is? We're facing across the Dead Sea, facing east. Does anybody know what mountains those are? They're kind of hills, though. Anybody know? Don't want to shout it out? Those are the mountains. That's Moab. Who said that? Nathan? Nathan always has a vital answer. I love that. <laughs> so that's Moab, right? Anybody know anything about Moab, those mountains of Moab? So, so who stood up on those mountains and looked out over the promised land? Anybody know? Moses, right? He looked out and he could see all over. And from up there, you could just see everything over the promised land on a clear day. You could just see it all. So beautiful. Now, here's the uh, 501 question. Uh, Alex, for a thousand, did Moses ever get to go in the promised land? No. Yes! Who showed, on the, who showed up with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Oh! oh. See, I got you, right? <laughs> Always check your facts. Uh, anyway, it was, a, it was a beautiful day there. Um, so here you'll see on our trip, you'll see Hannibal Lecter in the top left. <laughs> That's me. I have my neck thing that Jill got to help sleep in a chair. Uh, uh, Noise-canceling headphones. Thank you, uh, Kevin Trapp and Andy Smith for loaning us those. Those were awesome. <clears throat> and I was wearing that mask. Why? Because I was still coughing. And I did not want everyone to be mad at me sitting around uh, getting sick on a plane. So, uh, but there I was enjoying a little bit of sleep. We, we got to sleep. 14-hour flight, three times as much uh, hours on a flight I've ever been. Um, but it was, it, was, it was awesome. I mean, it really was fine. <coughs> Excuse me. Hey, what happened to my picture? I'm 
I know, huh? Hey, all my pictures are gone. What's supposed to be, hey, this is really cool. I can point with this thing here. Look, at there's a light here somewhere. Oh, look, right here, there was supposed to be a picture of, oh, the airplane. I was going to tell you that if you ever took a flight, like Israel and, and, and L.A. are about on the same place on the globe. But we did not fly that way. You know how we flew? We went to Canada and then to Scotland and through Europe. And it was like 4,000 miles shorter that way. I mean, right? Because it's just, who knew, right? But we're seeing the plane. Hey, we're going the wrong way. Anyway, it was really cool. Uh, I'm bummed out. So the, I, I had a picture up there of, uh, of so entering Israel. There was a picture of the, of the planes. I hope the rest of my pictures aren't messed up. But all this, you know, Jesus Rose of Sharon, our first trip from the airport to the hotel, uh, just a big plane of green. And the tour guide said, you know, Sharon really just means flat place. And, but you can just see how green it is and flat forever. And it was beautiful. And then uh, what else did I have there? I had, I had a picture of Jill and I. If you saw it on Facebook, uh, we, Jill put a, one up there of us in our hotel room, like the 11th floor looking down on the Mediterranean Sea. It was beautiful. Five-star hotel. Amazing accommodations uh, for that night. A few nights in a kibbutz. I don't know if you know what that is, but uh, that was, it was okay. Maybe a three-and-a-half-star thing. It was cool. But then in Jerusalem, another maybe four or five-star. Anyway, I'm not sure what happened there. It imported weird. But that I want you to see. We're talking about Herod the Great. Our first day of touring, we went to Caesarea, but not Caesarea Philippi. You understand? There's two Caesarea. Caesarea Philippi, we know Jesus went to Caesarea Philippi, which is up above the Golan Heights, further north from the Sea of Galilee. But this is not Caesarea Philippi. This is called like Caesarea Maritima, which simply means Caesarea on the sea or by the sea. And so this is a pretty cool place that Herod built, Herod the Great built. And it's one of the reasons he was so great. Uh, now, if you see, let's see if I can get this going on here. This is a really cool thing, or it was a minute ago, if I would use it properly. Okay, so like here, here there's a Roman-style theater, see that? That's pretty cool. Uh, right here, there's a temple that Herod built, kind of in honor of Rome, but also to Augustus. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Here's a hippodrome where they race hippos. Well, hippo's the Greek word for horse, so you knew what I meant, right? Uh, anyway, that uh, hippodrome held like 15,000 people uh, out here. Now, right here, I think this must be an older picture. I grabbed it because it was really cool. It, it looked really cool the way it's, it is. But right here, they're missing something. And um, so what they're missing is this. So this, is, this was right on site, and it's in my uh, brand new book I bought about Caesarea. Uh, but this is where Herod built his, his palace and also some administration, administrative buildings. But why do you suppose he built it there? It's kind of protected, isn't it? He was always worried someone was trying to get him, and they probably were, right? But anyway, so he built his palace out here. Um, and all of that is really amazing. But this right here is just the most amazing thing. Because the coastland of the Mediterranean Sea is almost just a straight line. And there is no harbor. And so how do you have a great city without a harbor? Right? So in about 10 BC, Herod built Caesarea. And he built this harbor over here. And, uh, and, and so the, the question is, like, you've got to have some kind of way of protecting the ships from these waves, right? But what do you build all this on? Like, it's only silt and sand. How are you going to build this? Well... I asked Ami to tell you a little bit about it. Let's see if it works. Oh, well, there's my beautiful wife, Jill, and I. Uh, these are some of the ruins of the hippo racing area uh, right here. Um, and then here, here's the, uh, the only place in the entire area, or maybe the world, where we find an inscription in stone about Pontius Pilate. Did you know that? Found in Caesarea. This is a replica. The real one's in a museum. But, but they have it here. <laughs> And, the, and you, can read the, you can read it on there if you read the Greek, and, and Pilate, it's Pilate dedicating a building to Tiberius Caesar, and it says Pontius Pilate there. So uh, only place that Pontius Pilate's found, because Caesarea had become the administrative build, uh, 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 kind of center and, and really the, the, uh, the capital, sort of, of Judea. 
it was recognized as the you know, administrative city of the entire area. And so here's, uh, here's that uh, Roman uh, um, a theater. And uh, here's, it did it again. This, this picture's wrong. Wow. It, pr uh, going from PowerPoint into our, uh, our pro presenter, this is supposed to be a picture of me preaching to everybody. Anyway, it was an awesome theater looking out over the, sea, the Mediterranean Sea. Just amazing. Uh, there was an amazing preacher a minute ago there, but he disappeared. But there's a stage area where they would have you know, performed like Alice in Wonderland and Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> I may have got some of my facts wrong. Uh, but, but there's clearly some places where uh, it looks like there, there were uh, sort of administrative buildings, courthouses, even jail cells. Okay, And, and so you can see the way they were set up. The, the different rooms, and uh, what we know is, uh, we know Peter sp spent uh, some time in these jails waiting Herod to kill him, Herod Agrippa I to kill him, there's lots of Herods. Uh, we know that Paul spent about two years here, Paul was here, um, he had to face, because they said he started a riot, he had to face uh, Felix, and then Festus, and then Agrippa II, and so uh, he spent uh, about two years waiting and talking, you know, and these guys are like, hey, bribe me and all that, uh, before he appealed to Rome. And we actually have a, a thing there. Uh, they, they show the scriptures. And then it says right down here, in 58 AD, the apostle Paul, accused of having caused a riot, was sent to Caesarea to be tried by the governor. Being a Roman citizen, he demanded to be heard by the emperor's court, sailed to Rome from Caesarea Harbor, and there he was tried a few years later, executed. And this hall may well have been the place of hearing mentioned in the Acts of Apostles. They're not exactly sure where all this took place, but they find these locations, they map it all out, say, you know, Paul could have been right here giving his defense. And so that, it's pretty cool. You know it's somewhere there, right? You're walking over the whole area, and he, Paul was here somewhere, and so was Peter. We don't know if Jesus ever made it to Caesar, this Caesarea. The Bible doesn't say he did, but the Gospel of John tells us he did many other things, right? And, and taught many other things that the Bible can't hold at all, right? Uh, the world, whole world couldn't hold all the books that could be written, so... This is a major city. Caesarea, uh, when it was built, had about 12,000 people that could live inside the walls. By the time of Jesus, like, what, 40 years later? 100,000 people, second only to Jerusalem in sort of, you know, brilliance and shining as, as, a, as a, a city in that area. This is a major deal here. So, I don't know, maybe Jesus did uh, make it here. Um, but this is the remnants, I think, uh, of what Herod did. And also on this side, there's me looking confused about how to use a camera and a selfie stick. Uh, but that's the protrusion that I think Herod built his palace on. It used to be Strato's Tower. There was kind of a city before. Not a big deal. Uh, but, but there was never really uh, protection for ships. And so here's where I asked Ami to tell us a little bit about it. Hopefully, maybe, right? Uh, there. Let's see if it works. Really? If it doesn't, I'll just tell you what he said. Uh, Matthew, do me a favor. Uh, try, like, however you normally click into it and then click one more time. It's not going to start? All right, I'll tell you what he said. Anyway, Ami's really cool. He's really fun, uh, and he knows all of it. I mean, I think he's been doing this for decades and decades. But what he told us there was that Herod... He needed a harbor, right? How do you have big ships come and they used to come and they'd have to put offload the little ships and then those would come in and they'd be in danger from the waves of turning over and stuff. But in order to have big ships, you've got to build a harbor. So Herod, Herod builds a foundation out there in the water by mixing a volcanic ash and gypsum into these big giant molded bricks uh, uh, or boxes and then he sinks them. And when they hit the water, they crystallize and become like cement. And so Herod builds this massive foundation for, for you see it out here? He builds this massive foundation for this thing here so that he can build on top of it these walls to stop these waves. And then you can see the gate up there in the corner where the ships would come in. And so he effectively just built a harbor out there. And that's quite a feat. That's amazing. And so that's how the city became so great because they were able to have big ships come and bring products and, and important people and all of that, okay? Um, one of the last things Ami says in, in his little uh, uh, clip that I had there, uh, 
is he talked about, uh, he, he says, now you can start to see how great Herod was, right? And then he talks about Herod building the temple in Jerusalem and how really uh, that's the major feat. That's the greatest thing. But, but this is, you know, second to that, but this is still amazing what Herod was able to do. But he, then he focused on the temple. And so I wanted to show you a little bit about what Herod did concerning the temple because, as Rick was talking about, there was this mound where Solomon had built a temple. It's Mount Moriah. And this is where Abraham had sacrificed Isaac, right? Or tried, right? And so this mound, if you see it right here, you, you see it, I mean, it's, it's a mound. Solomon was able to build a temple there, right? But what happens if you want to build this? Oh, come on! <laughs> Are they all going to be like that? No! Oh. So what it was supposed to look like up there is, this is a mound, and then uh, over here, he, he, our, his name is Yaakov. Uh, you probably know what that is in English. But right here, he had this big giant model of a temple. And he set it on this mound, and you could see it rocking back and forth because you can't put that big giant temple there. It's just not going to work, right? So Herod's got this huge temple he wants to build, but he can't put it there because it's just not enough flat spot. And so down here, you see this piece that looks like it could come off? So I had a picture of him actually taking that piece off right there where you see that dark line. Herod removed this huge amount of dirt to kind of get a little bit more of a uniform deal going on here. And then down in this picture, it actually showed this platform he built, four walls and a platform that made all this area here from out here, see this kind of wall out here? This whole area, all of this, it made it all flat. And then he put the big giant temple on that, and, the, and then the city, if I have it. Yeah. So here's a model of Jerusalem. This model is 1 to 50. So the temple right here, this temple building, if you're there, it's 3 feet high. Now how high is that in reality? 150 feet high. That's like 15 stories, right? Think about that. The, the picture that you didn't see of us in our hotel room was from 11 stories up. But this was 15 stories high. Isn't that amazing for 2,000 years ago? This temple was 15 stories high. And this is a model of the entire city that was able to be built on this flat sort of you know, area that, that Herod uh, built up. So, so there's the city. So yeah, Herod the Great. Well, why was he great? Because he did these awesome, amazing things. Um, and one other one that I want to point out, this is not really a Bible thing, but it is a great thing that Herod did. Uh, anybody ever hear of Masada? You know about Masada? So, uh, so you can see, we're, you know, this is a, we're way up here, and we're looking down on the, red, uh, the Dead Sea. Now, that's about the height way over there that we are. Now, try to guess, you can see how high we are above the Dead Sea. Try to guess how high above sea level we are. Anybody know? Thousand feet? Anybody else? Two hundred feet? We we are at sea level. Right here, right here, we are at sea level, <laughs> because the Dead Sea, the lowest place on the planet, I believe, uh, on land, uh, is thirteen hundred feet below sea level. So actually, way up here in this mountain fortress, we're we're actually at sea level, which is really weird, right? Um, but anyway, this fortress is amazing. Uh, when Rome under Vespasian, got you know, mad at the Jews in 66 because of their revolt. Uh, and then uh, uh, his son Titus took over in 70. Uh, they came and just wiped out Jerusalem and the temple and just wiped them out. A lot of people fled. Like over a 1,000 people fled to this temple fortress at Masada. And uh, you have to take these cables to get up there. You can walk this snake path. Well, no, you probably can't. Some of you could. But many of us could not walk that snake path or don't want to. But you take these cables to get way up there. And uh, here's me not using a selfie stick correctly, and I got flack for this. And Jill's going to get mad at me for showing you that I didn't use it correctly, because you're not supposed to see the selfie stick, right? <laughs> but anyway, we're having fun up there on the mountain fortress. Um, here's Jill. Birds just come to her, you know. She's so sweet. Uh, but look at this. Uh, this is supposed to be a different picture. <laughs> How does it do that? Who would have thought it would do that? Well, at least we have one picture. You know why this floor is like this? 
They had a suspended floor so you could light a fire and pump heat under there. You could heat up the room from below. Herod really was great in these ways. This is amazing stuff, but I had a bathhouse. It was all designed over here, and, and there, there's just there's so much to what's going on in this, in this mountain fortress. You just think this guy was a, a genius. He was amazing. And they're pretty cool, too. This is just another scene of the ruins, uh, looking out over the Dead Sea. Um, uh, but I just wanted you to get the idea of just how far up there it was, right? Because in 70, uh, after, after the temple, Rome chased these Jews to Masada. And over a thousand of them took refuge up there. And Rome was like, it's all right. We're just going to wait because you have no water. And so the Jews up there were washing their clothes and hanging them out to dry over the wall so all of Rome, you know, the army could see they've got plenty of water. We're going to be here all day. All year. Three years. Because Herod had built this with cisterns for water and grain and, and they were set. And, um, and so Rome had to build this siege tower. They had to build this siege tower right here in order to attack the wall and like with fire and stuff and, and, and fight. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. So they had to build a siege tower. And, um, and when it was looking bad for the Jews, um, and this is sad, but rather than being captured by the Romans and become Roman slaves, uh, there's evidence that they actually drew lots. All these names on these little shards uh, they drew lots, and, and we found these little tiny shards and, and with their names on them. And ten men, or ten people, I think, yeah, ten men, uh, were chosen by lot. And, and when the Romans breached the wall, those ten men would slaughter their families and everybody and then fall on their own swords. And they were just going to, that, that's what they would choose rather than become Roman slaves. And we know that because like two women and a couple children actually ran and hid and, and hid and, and were able to tell the story afterwards. But that's exactly what they did. When Rome breached the wall and was able to, to bring down part of the wall and, and make their way in, it was just it was mass, sort of mass suicide. They all, just, they all just died. So pretty sad. But think about it, how amazing it was that there's this mountain fortress that they were able to stay for, for a thousand people for three years. And so, and so I look at, I didn't know all this about Herod. I mean, that's why he was Herod the Great. But is he really Herod the Great? And this is my lesson for you, and it's not long. But I want you to think about this. Because, I mean, he may have looked great to the world, but what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? How do we define Greatness. That was amazing stuff, and he did more than that. But how do we define greatness? This is also who Herod is, and you knew this, right? You, you know what this is? It's called the Massacre of the Innocents. You remember that story? Here's another picture. And then one more. This is Herod the Great. Do you think that's great? Somebody said, well, you know, Bethlehem maybe had, you know, 20 kids in it. Look, if it's one kid, I mean, what if it's my kid? Is it horrible or not? But it wasn't just Bethlehem. The scripture says when Herod saw that he'd been tricked by the wise men, he became furious and sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem. And where? In all the region who were two years old or under, according to the time he had ascertained for the wise men. He went and killed all the little male children in the, in the whole region. And even if it was just one of mine, it would be horrible. Hor I mean, I don't even have a word for it, right? Herod the Great. In whose eyes? We know a lot of people who seem really great in our culture. They've done amazing things just like Herod has. And they're revered as, wow, these are really great people. But in whose eyes? We have to ask. We want to be like certain people. Are we sure? Because they're great in whose eyes? And why did Herod do this? Randy, what am I supposed to learn from Herod? Because I'm not going to go out and kill a bunch of kids. Do I really connect here? Yes, I do. Because it's not, that, it's not what he did, but why he did it. 
Why did Herod kill these babies? Somebody yesterday in the, pre, uh, the conference, the elders' conference, quoted what I was going to quote today. My favorite quote from the movie Rudy. You know what it is. I've learned two things in my life that I'm sure of. You know what it is. There is a God, and I'm not him. Herod did not learn that. Herod did not want to know that. Why did Herod kill those babies? Because a king was being born, and he had no room for a king in his life. He wanted to be king. I, I, uh, I love our church sign right now. If you've read it, did you read it? Each one of us is an innkeeper deciding, is there room for Jesus or not? Amen? Everybody in the world is an innkeeper having to decide, is there room for Jesus? This is where we connect with Herod. He decided there's no room for Jesus. And this is a human condition. It's not just him. It is humanity in the garden. What was the challenge? Hey, you can be like God in this way. Like, like God's given you everything. He's given you paradise. He's given you all the food and, and, and protection and security and, and love and paradise. Yeah, but you can be like God in a different way. Who's in charge? In Israel. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Don't mistake that for everyone did what was right. That's not what it says. Just everyone did whatever they thought was right. And you know what? When it says there's no king in Israel, it wasn't true. It was just true because Israel didn't recognize a king. There was a king in Israel. In Samuel it says, when you came and saw uh, Nahash, the king of Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but we want a king to reign over us. What they meant was like King Saul. They meant like they wanted somebody in armor that was big. And, and he says, no. He says, but, but the Lord God is your king. <laughs> There was no king in Israel, but there was, but you didn't recognize him. That's the human condition. That's the situation we're in. Why can't we be the Lord and kings of our own lives? Why can't we? Because there's a God and I'm not him. Why can't we? Because spiritually, humanity, we're like two-year-olds. Now, either you've been a two-year-old, you have a two-year-old sibling at some point, or you raise two-year-olds. Now, if a two-year-old sets his mind on sticking this hanger in that light socket and you tell him no or stop him, what are you going to get? You're going to get the furrowed brow. You're going to get the... He, he's going to start saying... Or she's going to start saying no to you. Why? Because we want to do what we want to do. A two-year-old can't possibly imagine how much you as a parent or even a sibling provide protection and food, and shelter, and, and everything necessary for their life. They can't even see it. All they know is, I want to stick this in the light socket, and you can't stop me. Anybody ever experienced a two-year-old like that? That's who we are. Apart from Jesus, we are like those two-year-olds. And so we need a king. There is a God, but I'm not him. We need a king. And so, and so Jesus, he calls us out of this worldly mentality where we have a, the wrong view of what greatness truly is. And he calls his disciples together. He says, you know, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. That's what the world says is great. That's what the world says is, is power. But he says not to be like that with you. Whoever wants to become great among you must be what? You've got to be a servant. You have to, if you want to be great, you have to become a slave. Not flexing your muscle, not I'm in charge, not I'm better than you, not look how great I am. That's not it. That's the way of the world. And so James invites us, if we are, if we're not seeing things spiritually, if we found ourselves trying to be our own God and our own Lord and our own King and making our own choices about, about life and ignoring God, but we want to make a change, James says this, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Let your laughter change to mourning and your joy to gloom. And do what? This is what we all have to do. This is a choice that we have to make to make room for Jesus right here. Every single one of us. 
humble yourselves before the Lord. And he will what? That's how you become great. That's how you become great. That's great in, in the only eyes that really matter in this life. When all is said and done, that's what matters. So that, that's what I learned from King Herod. I learned that in the eyes of the world, he's an amazingly great guy, but he's the one that slaughtered the children. We need a king, and Jesus is the king. So if you want to submit your life to him uh, today, or if you want to make a greater commitment today, we'd love to pray with you about that. We'd love to um, in, encourage you in, in that journey. Uh, if you want to make a response to him in any way, uh, we're going to sing a song, and you're welcome to come up.